This is Sunday, August 20th. Our lesson is number 12 uh, from Unit 3. The title of our lesson is Speaking Up. Our devotional reading is 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 16. Our background scripture is from the book of Acts the ninth chapter, verses 1 through 31, and our printed passage is from the book of Acts, the ninth chapter, verses 10 through 20. And our key verse is Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts the ninth chapter, verse 17. Our lesson's aims are analyze the sequence of events before and during Ananias' witness to Saul. Reflect on the times of questioning and resisting God's call. Develop spiritual maturity that breaks down one's resistance to calls of God. Our lesson today uh, creates a uh, very insightful incident within the life of Saul, who was later named Paul by the Roman authorities. Um, we see here a unfolding of a plan on the life of Paul that was ordained and destined to take place long before Paul's knowing. And we can see how this whole incident unfolds and is orchestrated by a divine power, by the power of God, who knows our ending before our beginning. And it's a uh, it has quite a few insightful turns in the events here. Um, there is a saying that we often use when we mention that if you really want to make God laugh, tell God your plan. And so as we engage into our lesson, let's just see how we plan things and how God intervenes to fulfill his will and his plan. Our lesson starts out uh, by revealing to us that God had uh, destined to engage a particular man in the activities of Saul's life. And that man's name was Ananias. And the scripture tells us that the Lord appeared to Ananias in a vision. And when he did, Ananias, being a upright and devout and a faithful believer, that uh, Ananias readily or immediately responded uh, and said, yes, Lord. And the Lord told him to go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. So, Ananias had no idea that the Lord was going to call him in a vision and have him to perform a work 
which led to a greater work in the life of someone else. But he was a effective uh, player in the role of fulfilling God's will in the life of one who was persecuting the believers. And so one of the things that we recognize here is, is that uh, sometimes we are called to intervene into the outcome of a destined plan which is not necessarily directly affected to us, but it is part of the fulfillment of a plan affecting the lives of someone else or others. And this is the case as it is with Ananias. Now, as we look into our lesson, we find uh, our lesson starting with verse 10, which is where Ananias was actually commissioned by God to perform this work. Uh, first, we recognize that uh, Ananias, he uh, readily responded once he recognized that God called him in this vision. But we also see beginning at verse 13 through verse 16, that after he realized what God had placed upon him or challenged him or charged him with uh, his, his involvement uh, in this work, we then see the real side of ourselves for we see Ananias saying to the Lord that, Lord, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm that he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. How he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. So Ananias right away begins to explain to the Lord as though God is not aware, but he explains to the Lord the circumstances that persist here. He says that, now, I'm not sure if you've heard this, but I have heard many reports about this man. Uh, he's been persecuting many people who have called out on your name. He has, he's no respecter of individual. He has done it to men and women. He, um, elderly as well as the young. Um, he's, he's even gotten approval and okay for this from the chief priest uh, the same ones that uh, persecuted you, Lord, uh, when you were amongst us, these same uh, Pharisees and Sadducees, these same priests are the same ones who are engaged in the continuation of the persecution of people who have followed your teachings, people who have submitted themselves to your will. Not people that are rebel rousers, not people that are agitators, uh, not people that are uh, seeking out to create havoc, but people who are on the other end of the havoc. The believers are the recipients of aggression and suppression uh, because they have chosen to submit their lives unto God. And so many times when we look at these uh, outcomes, these uh, atrocities and these misfortunes in life, um, it is not God's doing. It is 
at the whims of those who have chosen not to submit themselves to a divine order and to holy and righteous living. So here we see a, a true example of the lives of those who live according to a higher calling and the outcome, the results, and the examples of those who live unto themselves, who submit to superficial and temporary means of what has been noted as power, but is really wickedness. So we see here that Ananias is somewhat resistant because Ananias uh, naturally, as many who are at the whims and at the uh, outcome of evildoers, of wicked rulers and those in position of authority and power, uh, many do not want to participate by any means in any types of engagements that assist those who already have a record and a reputation of being like totally to the opposite of what God is calling mankind to be. Many are quite reluctant and hesitant about helping in any cause towards that effort. So when Ananias questions God, he really is not questioning his respect and his honor and his reverence for God, but he is really just citing the things that has caused his hesitation is that now I've heard a lot about this fella and uh, I'm just wondering, you know, are you sure about this? So God ends his, the perplexities of his mind and he says to him, go to this man in my choose, uh, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles, to the unbelievers, to the ungodly, and their kings, and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Now, I said earlier that uh, if we uh, want to make God laugh, to tell him our plans. And isn't it ironic how at one moment we are just uh, overwhelmed and, you know, just caught up in our own schemes and our own plans. And so Paul here uh, at the beginning of the ninth chapter, it talks about how he, you know, was caught up in the zeal of threatening and murdering the disciples of the Lord and how he went to the people of authority, as it were, asking their permission, you know, on his way to Damascus so that he continues this slaughter as though he was getting, you know, a decree like a written documentation uh, from the synagogues, you know, and almost like an arrest, a, a, a written arrest. And so he gets their permission and stuff. And then it talks about how that it didn't matter to him if they were men or women. He just wanted to get anybody who was, uh, as they called them during that day, Christians. He wanted to get anybody who was a follower of Christ and, and how that, because they were followers of the teachings of Christ, how that was somehow, you know, just a, uh, uh, like a total reverse of what they were proclaiming, the chief priest and the whole group uh, being the Pharisees and uh, being devout 
uh, Judaism practitioners. And so when we uh, look at this and read these first voice uh, verses here, then we see how God visits Saul on his journey to Damascus to continue his onslaught of the believers. And to get his attention, he shines a light against or around Saul. And the light is so bright that it removes Saul's sight. And Saul is now blinded. He can't see. And sometimes we are so caught up in ourselves that we can't see what God intended for us to see. So in order that we might see again, God removes the sight that once was present. So Paul was blinded by the purity and the brightness of God. And he says to uh, Saul, why are you kicking against the goads? Now, the goads were um, uh, instruments that uh, were used uh, by plowmen when they would uh, strap them on to the uh, oxen. And uh, so when he was saying that uh, you were kicking against the go goads or against the pricks, um, it was as though you were trying to kick against something that was way more powerful than you as an individual are. Uh, sometimes we are uh, uh, trying to inflict force against something that is so much more powerful than the force we are able to exert against it until it's absolutely foolishness. Uh, but we don't see it. We continue to try and exert what limited power we have against something that totally encompasses all power. And so what Christ in the vision, in the appearance, the spiritual presence of Christ speaking to Saul, what he was telling him was, is that you, you can't defeat me. You can't defeat my work. Why are you kicking against what you cannot defeat? So he says to him, I want you to arise and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. And as we end with the instructions that was given unto Saul, that begins our lesson. As he told Saul that there was going to be a man who was going to appear unto him and his name was Ananias. And so this is to confirm unto Paul that now what you see is the fulfillment of what I revealed to you when I stopped you on your journey to the road to Damascus. And so when the fulfillment of what Christ had revealed to Saul came about, now he knew that this was of God and that this was the fulfillment of what was told unto him. And so now once Ananias had entered into the presence of Saul, let's hear how this, this arrangement actually unfolds. I'm reading from the NIV. 
And the 17th verse says, Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Now, now Paul had been here uh, for about three days without sight, and he hadn't eaten, he hadn't uh, drank anything. He was just there, and uh, uh, the uh, text tells us that he was praying. Uh, so when, when, when Ananias arises, uh, arrives, he, he placed his hands on Saul and he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately the scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Then Paul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, let's look at the irony here. Now, now, Paul has lost his sight, but now Ananias comes and he does exactly what the Lord told Ananias that he was going to do. And once you have your sight has been removed and then you begin to see again, you see anew. Now, without Ananias explaining anything to Saul, he recognized that he had had an experience that none like himself had actually partaken then. None like himself who had been such an adversary against God and against the Son of God. None had experienced such an endeavor here, such an occurrence. And so now he realizes that there is a higher power, that there is a divine order. And notice how Ananias intervenes here. The scripture says that Ananias did as he was instructed, but the scripture doesn't give us any text that says that, well, then Ananias started uh, telling Paul, uh, telling Saul what he thought about him. It didn't say that then uh, Ananias uh, started saying to Saul, let me get, let me get something straight before I leave you here. Uh, it just says that Ananias did what the Lord instructed him to do. And then Ananias began to see what the Holy Spirit was doing to Saul and account for what he was instructed to do. And so sometimes uh, we like to engage into the outcome of God's work. Sometimes we like to intervene to make sure that all the bases that we think need to be touched, to make sure all the little details that we think need to be covered. So we begin to engage uh, to make sure that the people on the other end recognize what they have done against us and to make them feel our pain. And so we like to like, we like to help God in his work uh, to get involved just in case he might forget something. But the text doesn't tell us that Ananias did any of that. He just did what he was instructed. And then he, along with the other disciples in Damascus, they began to see the change that God had done 
to Saul. Now, as we close and we look at this, think about, now I'm going to go back a verse here. When we go back to the 16th verse, after God had spoken unto Ananias and said, this man is my chosen instrument. Now, now look at how this is, is worded. Uh, this is not my, my chosen servant. Uh, uh, this is not my, my chosen executive. Uh, this, this is not my, my chosen president. This is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Now you remember Paul, as it was after he was changed, Paul was an instrument of persecution and suppression to the believers. And in the end, he becomes one who now will also suffer for bearing the name of Christ. And so we are told later through Acts and all through the other letters that Paul wrote to the early church. Um, we are told that Paul suffered many uh, stripes. He was imprisoned. He was beaten and such. Uh, they were those that were planning uh, his death to kill him as he witnessed in, in the eighth chapter. You remember uh, Saul was there when uh, Stephen was stoned to death. And so uh, another righteous man who, who was persecuted by bearing the name of the teachings of Christ. So Paul was there when they stoned Stephen to death. Uh, he was the one who was actually bearing the clothes. And so uh, they, they dropped him at the feet of Saul. Uh, so um, it's, it's kind of ironic when we look at how the Lord changes the positioning of us in life. Uh, we are once against the people, then we find out we are of the people. Uh, and so the lesson today uh, causes us to see that uh, we don't always uh, have to have the immediate results of something uh, right in our presence at that moment. But Paul uh, got firsthand evidence of being against a power that was greater than himself. And just as he, with all of his zeal and with all of his vigor and with all of his, his uh, uh, fortitude and, and strength, uh, exerted all of that energy towards persecuting a people who had done nothing to him. Now, because he became who the people are. Now the same persecution is visited upon him. And look at the irony that God sets among the recipients. Because he shows them also how powerful God is. This man who once was with you to persecute and try to destroy my teachings, my ability to transform people and change them. Now I have changed him. And now you persecute him who once was a part of you. So we hope that something in our lesson uh, has struck a nerve with the recipients who have heard it. Uh, we hope and pray that it will direct you in a better understanding of God's functioning and purpose in our lives. And that most importantly, we will yield and submit ourselves to the will of God. 
God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.